Welcome everyone and welcome to Open Education Week, um, which is a week-long series of events um, uh, both online and locally um, that um, seek to promote open education and awareness of open education uh, worldwide. Um, this afternoon, um, I have the pleasure of presenting with um, three of my colleagues from the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources um, on innovation um, in community colleges. And once again, this is Una Daly, Community College Outreach Director at the Open Courseware Consortium. Uh, we have Dr. Preston Davis from Northern Virginia Community College, uh, Dr. Donna Goday from Scottsdale Community College in Arizona, and Quill West from Tacoma Community College in Washington State. I'm going to take you just through a few technical uh, overviews here. Um, some of you may be new to uh, the Collaborate system that we're using. On your left-hand side, you'll see a column that has your audio and video controls um, where you can control your speaker uh, uh, volume there. Um, directly underneath that, you'll see the participants. You should see yourself logged in here as well. And then there is the chat window directly underneath that um, where you can type in messages um, or questions to the presenters as we go along. Uh, some of our presenters will um, answer questions as, as we go along and we'll save some of the maybe longer questions for the end. And if there's no more questions about the Collaborate window, we'll go ahead and move on again. Um, once again, um, please introduce yourself in the chat window if you haven't had a chance to do that. Um, thank you to all of you who have already done that. And today, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Community College Consortium at the OpenCourseWare um, and a little overview of OER. And then we're going to go directly into our uh, featured presentations today, our first one being on OER-based general education certificate at Northern Virginia Community College. Secondly, we're going to hear about a basic arithmetic MOOC um, case study uh, being um, taught by uh, Dr. Donna Goday at Scottsdale Community College. And uh, finally, we are going to hear from OER project director Quill West at Tagoma Community College about the institutional adoption of OER and how to make that successful at your college. So first, a brief overview of open educational resources. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, but this definition, uh, which is endorsed by the U.S. Department of Education, also uh, UNESCO, and the Hewlett Foundation, which is a large supporter of open ed worldwide, are very similar. Teaching, learning, and resource, research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. Um, these um, resources really can um, vary greatly in format from open courses, uh, to open textbooks, to individual videos such as the ones available at the Khan Academy. So really any tool, material, or technique that supports ready access to knowledge. And an open license um, makes these materials free to use online, free to print out, um, reusable within your classroom, and modifiable. And just to give you a little sense of the flavor of it, if you look at the picture at the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, a, uh, a continuum where we start with traditional copyright, which is the big C. Um, in between that sits Creative Commons, which is the open licensing system most accepted today in the education world. And finally, on the far end, public domain. So Creative Commons sits on top of traditional copyright and allows the holder of the copyright to open it up to um, additional sharing. And if you want more information about that, I suggest you go to creativecommons.org, which is um, listed there at the bottom. And I'll also put that in the, um, in the chat window in a moment. So 
we at the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, our mission is expanding access to education for students and learners. Um, so we do that through promoting the adoption of OER in the classroom to enhance teaching and learning. We support professional development, um, and this webinar here during Open Education Week is, is truly a part of that, um, where we invite leaders from the community college who are engaged in OER to come and um, talk about best practices and lessons learned. And we are a voice for open education at community colleges. Um, we have over 150 community and technical colleges within North America. Um, but we are not really restricted by geography, and we're very open to having members join us uh, worldwide. So um, please consider it. Um, our spring webinars, here's a list. We've already had a couple that have occurred um, since the beginning of the year. They are archived on our website and um, available on YouTube. And once again, I will um, post uh, our website in the chat window in a moment. Um, we have a couple more coming up later on this spring. We have an OER authoring tool in March, at the end of March, um, where we'll hear from Connections, um, the BC Campus Pressbooks folks, and also from SoftChalk, um, which is a uh, commercial tool for developing OER. Uh, finally, at the end of April, we will hear about California's open textbooks and MOOC. Uh, strategies and legislation. Um, California is leading in some of these areas um, at the moment. And finally, in June, we will have um, a webinar on future trends in open education. We're keeping that one open since things are changing very rapidly. All right. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Preston Davis. Uh, who is the Director of Instructional Services for NOVA's Extended Learning Institute, where he's responsible for learning and technology resources for distance learning, serving over 20,000 students annually. He's a member of the Community College Consortium um, for Open Educational Resources and also serves on Virginia Community College Systems Textbook Costs and Digital Learning Resources Workgroup. He's developed and taught undergraduate and graduate courses since 1999 and is a strong advocate for the development and use of open content. And today he's going to tell us about the OER-based general education certificate program that he and his staff are working on um, this spring for deployment um, next fall. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, you so much. I hope everybody can hear me okay. You sound Great. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy to talk about uh, this project that we have going on at Northern Virginia Community College, uh, which we refer to as uh, our OER-based general education certificate program. So basically what we've done at NOVA um, is <coughs> through our Extended Learning Institute, which is the distance education unit of the college. Uh, we applied for a grant through the Chancellor's Innovation Fund in the state of Virginia to create a series of general education courses. Um, these courses fit into a certificate program that generally makes up the first year of an associate's degree program. Um, but these courses can also be taken um, by students who are not necessarily pursuing the certificate but need those courses for uh, either another associate's degree at the college or to transfer to another four-year institution. But we wanted to take these series of courses that had a pretty substantial footprint and build those courses around open educational resources. And some of the goals that we have for this particular project uh, are to create a greater awareness of open educational resources at NOVA. And that is for faculty, staff, administration, and students alike. Um, we want to help faculty identify existing open educational resources um, or create new open educational resources um, for their courses. Um, we think that this will definitely lead to improved teaching and learning. Um, and finally, will certainly help in our goal at the community college 
um, to be affordable and accessible to all learners, not only in our community, um, but throughout the state and, and even beyond that. Um, and so the courses that we are developing at Northern Virginia Community College will be shared with all of the uh, community colleges in the state of Virginia and the content will be openly available for others to adopt as well. Um, but we want to do this in a way so that our students are not having to pay for textbooks uh, which can run $300 or more in courses and in some cases the cost of the textbooks in some of our science courses um, can even exceed the cost of the tuition of the actual course that the student has taken. Um, so we want to do something to uh, show that there are a great number of um, educational resources that are out there um, that students can use and that faculty can take advantage of um, that do not necessarily require um, purchasing expensive textbooks and relying on or, or being um, uh, having to deal with the, the changeover and, 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 and additions and things that sometimes come along with those things. And so we selected a group of courses uh, that would have a very large footprint across the college uh, because the general education certificate program is something that all of our students should come in contact with in some way. At least some of the courses will be required um, for just about any program that we offer. And so we took our English composition uh, series courses um, that we offer at the college, um, um, <clears throat> as well as a literature course, um, our college math course, um, and we had to pick a lab science course, and we are using our physics course. Uh, we have American History series. Um, for our humanities and fine arts uh, requirement, we are doing uh, an art course, um, a series. Um, the uh, social science um, requirement is a history of film course that uh, we think is one that is going to be very dynamic and, and will appeal to a lot of students. Um, and then finally, we have a student development course that's required for all graduates of NOVA. And that is one that all students at the college, uh, regardless of degree, are required to take. And so that will definitely have a, a big impact across the college. And so <clears throat> we wanted to select faculty who already had some familiarity with open educational resources to sort of set the example and set the tone for this particular project. Uh, we looked at folks who had a history of providing high quality and innovative instruction um, as well as an understanding and application of sound um, teaching pedagogy. Um, as an online program, we really need to make sure that we are offering courses that engage students at a distance. Um, and we wanted to make sure that um, the folks would be able to operate within the, the constraints uh, uh, or, or, or guidelines, I should say, of you know, this grant funding um, to put something out there and available for students starting in the fall semester. And so folks that you know, had some awareness and, and had incorporated a few items into their courses um, that were open. Um, are ones that really have shown an interest in expanding that further and, and really taking their course sort of all the way to the, to the goal line, so to speak, in terms of um, OER content. So <coughs> we have <coughs> provided a small stipend uh, to the faculty who are participating in this program uh, to redesign their course, um, doing away with um, traditional textbooks um, or software packages that students are required to purchase, um, and instead uh, replacing the material that they were using uh, with open educational resources. Um, we have provided a series of staff here to assist with that. Um, I am, am an available resource to, to help um, point faculty 
in, in the right direction uh, in terms of resources as well as uh, our librarian. We have an online librarian at NOVA who does an excellent job working with faculty, providing them with uh, links to resources and content and helping them uh, figure out what types of things will fit into their course as well as our instructional design team. Uh, the instructional designers uh, really take uh, our courses and make sure that they are dynamic and engaging and, and really deliver a high quality um, educational experience uh, for our online students. And so they are working with the faculty who are participating in this project to make sure that the course is ready to deploy in the fall semester and, and will be comparable to any uh, course that we had offered previously that used traditional textbook materials. Um, and once these courses are completed, we will be uh, making these courses available um, and sharing um, this uh, with the community um, and, and licensing it so that the material can be reused. That's something that is very important to us. And so the hope is that this project, um, we'll, we'll be able to promote this project to the students at NOVA, um, both those who are interested in the certificate and, and going on into uh, an associate's degree, uh, as well as those who are coming to uh, NOVA to take um, transfer courses to another institution. Um, we want to be able to uh, appeal to both of those populations. Um, and we want to make sure that we're letting folks know that this is a way that we are trying to uh, be more affordable and accessible to our students. Um, and I believe that uh, as students see that this is an option and if these courses are delivered correctly, the students will want more opportunity to take courses using open educational resources versus um, having to spend money on textbooks and other uh, traditional material. Um, and that they will help to drive future development and expand this, this project uh, far beyond just this certificate program um, and into a program uh, that is adopted college-wide and will translate into many more courses being offered that are based on open educational resources. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or wait until uh, everyone has a chance to, to speak and, and, and uh, entertain questions or comments at the end. Um, um, thank you very much, uh, Preston. Um, why don't you go ahead? Uh, there is one question, at least, in the chat window. Okay. And go ahead and um, answer Eric if you can. OK. Is this the, when do you anticipate and where will these courses be available for other institutions to use in Remix? Um, well, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to deploy them in um, our systems uh, learning management system so that those are available to all of the other community colleges within the state of Virginia. But then we're going to take the content that we are developing and we're going to sort of create um, course outlines and course templates with the materials that we are using. Um, and those will be available through links, uh, say, um, information on that through the um, CCCOER website um, and through other areas that folks can contact us. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to create an actual page uh, or, or a site within our web page um, for the college that will showcase these and provide information on that content um, to folks who are interested in taking those. And anyone can contact me individually um, as we are going through this project um, and I'd be happy to sort of share the, the process and, and uh, hopefully not too many uh, bumps along the way but um, sort of what it is that we're doing and how things are progressing. All right. Thank you very much, Preston. And that's very exciting. And um, I, I know a lot of people will be interested in, um, in your progress and success. Great. Thank you. All right. If we don't have any more questions uh, for um, Preston at this time, we will uh, move on to um, our next presenter. And we can, um, we'll have time at the end, as I mentioned, to uh, recap. So um, our next presenter is Dr. Donna Godet. Um, she is a technologist, mathematics professor with an educational background in applied mathematics and instructional technology. In the classroom since 1989, Donna has focused since 1997 on teaching math online and since 2004 on teaching math in a hybrid format. 
To support her online and hybrid students, she has written open source instructional lessons and workbooks and has created over 300 instructional videos. And in addition um, to all of that wonderful work, uh, Donna has uh, just started teaching a basic arithmetic MOOC that she developed. And I believe you're about six weeks yes. into that course, right Donna? Yes. All right, Donna, um, please uh, tell us okay, more. So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, to my knowledge, the first basic arithmetic MOOC. And it is currently being delivered through the Canvas network. Uh, it's a separate site away from the hosted Canvas site that they've set up just for these uh, massively open online courses. And um, I'm assuming that probably everyone on the call has heard the term MOOC. Uh, I didn't really know what it meant until a couple of months ago, maybe five or six months ago, I started hearing a lot about it. And I went to the New York Times article that was published in 2012 uh, about 2012 being the year of the MOOC, which I didn't know either until I saw the article. Um, and I just took all of the words in that article and I put them into a Wordle, uh, a Wordle site and it came up with this kind of diagram. So you can see um, all of the words that uh, were repeated during the article, especially the word MOOC, of course, and kind of some of the important aspects of the MOOC um, space or the MOOC community that I'll talk about here in just a minute. So I just thought it was kind of an interesting um, graphic to get us started. And if you have questions as we go along, um, feel free to type them in the chat room. And if I'm not able to address them during the presentation, I'll do so at the end or when we have time. So, um, so feel free if you have questions. And so I wanted to start off with just a little bit of a background on MOOCs in case you don't uh, really know much of the history. MOOCs really started in 2008. There was one MOOC in 2008. And the term MOOC was actually coined in 2008. So before then, uh, we didn't have MOOCs, I guess. So this year, there's projected to be 118 MOOCs that will be offered. And you've probably started to hear more and more about some of the major players in the MOOC space which are uh, Coursera, Udacity, and edX. And Coursera and Udacity both um, came out of uh, work by a couple of Stanford professors that offered some MOOCs to Stanford that were very successful. And then edX, of course, um, not to be outdone by Stanford, MIT and Harvard kind of got together and they're working on, on the edX delivery. So you can see sort of you know, the funding and the courses that they have. So Coursera is really the one that's sort of pushing the envelope. It's got the most going on in terms of um, content right now. There's some MOOC events that have happened over the last you know, very short history. Of course, the term MOOC was coined. The very first MOOC was offered by a school in Canada, University of Manitoba, and it actually had 25 on-ground tuition paying students and 2,300 students that were out in the universe taking the course and interacting for free. Um, so that information is displayed on the 2008 timeline. And then you can see kind of not a lot in 2011, but that was the first Stanford course. And then really uh, there was a lot going on in 2012. So maybe that was the year of the MOOC compared to the years that came before. Um, so more and more and more going on and more and more that you hear about in the media. And um, I think it's very important, especially for this week, this open ed week, for folks to understand that the word open and massively open online course does not at all mean the same thing as the open and open educational resources. In fact, most MOOCs, I would say, or uh, well, I don't have the numbers, but I know that um, MOOC does not mean open content. What it means is open tuition. So there's no charge to access the materials in terms of their, their digital display. However, a lot of instructors will require the purchase of you know, a textbook anywhere from $10 to $100 to $150. Um, <coughs> yes, exactly, uh, Una. So it is more of an open enrollment situation. It's definitely not assumed to be open materials. And very often uh, with MOOCs, you'll start to see some information coming out about certification and especially this 
testing in California now that might go through. But students may have to pay for getting that um, certification of completion at the end. Um, so just be careful when you when you see that word and when you see a MOOC, you know, how much does it really cost to take this course? Um, and so the course that I'm going to talk about is the basic arithmetic course that I've been working with. And there's a great website called Class Central. I have the URL there on the page. So if you want to look at a list of current MOOCs that are going on, it's pretty extensive. You can go to that website and do a search and see. And actually, so the basic arithmetic MOOC that I'm working with um, is listed there uh, on, their, on their site. And just to give you an idea of um, the course, it is a full arithmetic course. It is the same competencies as the course that I teach for my institution, which is Scottsdale Community College in Arizona. Um, the big difference, of course, is the students do not um, pay tuition. They're not enrolled through the institution. The course isn't delivered through the Canvas instance um, that's associated with our institution. So we're separate in every way except that I happen to be teaching it and I happen to be an employee there. And so we're associated by name um, because of that. I did uh, go with an initial enrollment limit of 500 for this course, which seemed like a whole lot of people to me when I first got started. Um, and, and now it really doesn't. Because you'll, as you'll see, um, 500 doesn't really mean 500. So um, the materials for the course are all completely free. These are materials that were developed primarily by myself. And I had some help from a colleague as well. So it's free download. If they want a hard copy, they can um, order from Lulu for printing and um, shipping only. And then the online assessments are done through the WAMAP system that uh, comes from My Open Math, which was created by David Lippman, who I think is on the um, session today. At least I saw him log in earlier. Um, no tuition or enrollment to SEC is actually a 13-week term. And the assignments are um, self-graded with solution guides and computer graded with the um, online assessment tool. The content is delivered through the print workbook uh, or printed materials and then videos that go along with. And completers will receive a completion statement that's basically certified by me that says, yeah, you finished and, and you got a 70% or above. Um, so it's pretty lockstep in terms of the curriculum. It's very um, self-paced in that way. But I have discussion boards and things that I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. So when I started with the enrollment for the course, um, uh, sorry, Jerry, I just got distracted by your comment. I'm going to have to look at that in a minute. Um, when I started with the course, the enrollment started back in September, October. I thought, oh, shoot, there's only going to be maybe 60, 70 people. I mean, who would want to sign up for a MOOC on basic arithmetic? Well, the numbers started growing and growing and growing. And before I knew it, I had 500 students. So that was back in probably October or early November that the course closed with 500. Um, and the course itself didn't actually start until February. And you can see that it, it was kind of exciting that people all over the world, you know, Africa and you know, parts of Asia and South America and Australia and New Zealand are going to be taking my course. And I did a little survey of them at the beginning. And I asked them a lot more questions than this. But the ones that were kind of interesting, I thought, was their education level. So I didn't really know where they were going to be coming from. And most of the students that completed, I had about 85 uh, complete the survey, said that they had either graduated from high school, graduated from college, or the one at the bottom that's all responses is actually they have a graduate degree. So they were what I would consider you know, pretty well educated um, people. A lot of them already had degrees, uh, either college or graduate degrees. And then I asked them, because I, I know that with MOOCs, a lot of people might just come in and out. Uh, what is your intent? Do you intend to complete the whole course? And almost everyone, like 92% of those that, that took the survey said, yeah, uh, I'm going to complete the whole course. So you know, that would have been like 60, 70 people that were planning on doing that. And so then I extrapolated that to the 500, which I probably shouldn't have done, because if they didn't respond to the survey, they probably weren't going to complete the whole course. But I was kind of hopeful that I might have some good numbers um, coming in for completion. 
the reality is this. Um, so I had 500 that were signed up on day one. Only 100 people have taken the orientation quiz, which is required. So it's set up in Canvas as a prerequisite module that they go through the orientation items. And once they complete the quiz, which basically says, I've gone for the orientation, then everything else will open. So uh, 100 people completed the orientation quiz. 75 people created their MathAS account, which is our online assessment um, tool that we're using. And they had to go to the orientation quiz to get that information. And then 53 completed lesson one. 53 out of 500, so about 10%. So you can see the um, access statistics. I have a little graph there. So the 4th of February is when the course started. So there were you know, 2,500 accesses. Um, I forget how many people. It was, it was a good number of people, maybe 150 people accessed on the first day. And that's a fantastic um, exponential decay graph that I think I might give to some of my um, classes. Yeah, very, very typical pattern uh, for participation. So I learned some things. And I'm going to take these things into my next offering. I did apply with the Canvas network to go ahead and offer the class again. Um, I've asked them to increase the enrollment from 500 to 2,500. And also to decrease the time span between when the class is advertised and when it starts. Because I sort of feel like what sounded good to people in October probably didn't sound so good um, in February. And a lot of people might have signed up just because they thought, hey, cool, this is that MOOC thing. I'll learn more about it. So as the MOOCs continue, maybe we'll get students that are actually more serious about completing the course and not just kind of interested in how it's set up. Um, I'm also going to plan to advertise the certificate of completion early on, which I, I did not do. I had to get clearance through my institution um, to be able to do that. So, um, and then I had initially anticipated, you know, 500, like I was going to get hit with this, these waves that I wasn't going to be able to handle. So in Canvas, I split everything up. And in the online assessment system, I had 10 different courses, and they had to enroll by their last name and all of that. So all that did was just give me 10 different places I had to check all the time. So you know, I've decided for the next one just to kind of put everybody in one place and then just see how it goes. And if it boils down to this 10% you know, or less, then it shouldn't be um, a difficult thing to manage in terms of the aspects of the technology. So you know, one of the things that um, I'm kind of interested in is where this MOOC thing is going in terms of, especially community colleges, because that's where I am. I mean, education in general, of course. Um, you know, it's still early. I'd say there's not a lot of community colleges in the MOOC space, although there's some that are starting to come in. I know there's some colleges back east that are, are starting to work on some MOOC projects. Um, the completion numbers are not encouraging, so uh, I'm actually giving a presentation about MOOCs to our educational board in a couple of weeks. And I want to be really, really careful with the message that I give to them because you know, MOOCs sound really great. I mean, everything that they're tuition free and if they're open resources as well. I mean, they're great ways for students to access. But especially in developmental education, the students that most need the access are the students that most struggle. And so I really, I am not at all convinced that MOOCs are the answer in terms of just having this stuff out there. They're going to magically do it and get through it when they haven't been able to get through it in a classroom. Um, but I think that there may be some potential for some hybrid MOOCs online um, types of options. Something, I mean, I think they need to be explored, but I think they need to be explored carefully so that we don't lose the essence of the communication and the interaction that I think is so critical in learning, especially for students at developmental ed. Um, so I would say um, those are the things that I have learned. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Someone asked what was the greatest challenge in implementing the MOOC. Um, and it wasn't really, I, I think, well, the first aspect was just it took a lot of time to put the course together because I wanted it to be perfect because I just envisioned you know, 500 people from all around the world. So I kind of was a little bit ADA with it and, and overdid, overdid it, or OCD, I should say. Um, but I think the challenge was just trying to wrap my mind around you know, what would I do if 500 people all just sent me an email to say hello? I mean, how would I, nap, how would I channel 
that communication and be able to deal with it. Because, I mean, you really can't, um, if 500 people decided to say hello, you really couldn't address that. So thinking about the ways to channel the different communications, but yet maintain a sense of um, intimacy and interaction with the students and a sense of community, I think, is a challenge. So um, let's see. I'm reading Jim's, Jim's question. Yep, I agree. I totally agree. So I'm with you, Jim. Any other questions? Una, how am I doing? I'm, I think I'm right on with time. Or I, Yeah, I think you're right on time. You know, one thing, um, Donna, that you had mentioned to me in an earlier conversation, you said that you had um, under 5% of your uh, learners were actually um, community college students from Scottsdale. Oh, yeah. I would say at this point even probably less than that. I mean, if if they were there, they didn't rise to the surface and complete any of the activities. So. <laughs> um, and we okay. and we didn't really advertise so, uh, it local. General community. Okay, that's that's a good point. It wasn't advertised for community college students. Yeah, and it's not so that we not wouldn't think about doing something like that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's not like we wouldn't think about doing that in the future. In fact, I'm going to have a little talk with my VP about the next offering of the MOOC um, to see if we do want to advertise it and how we would go about doing that. Okay. So, thank Great. you, everyone. Thanks, Donna. All right. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Cole West, who is the OER Project Director at Tacoma Community College. Um, the most important thing that you should know about Quill is that she's passionate about students achieving success through access to education and quality learning experiences. Most recently, she's been working to reach that goal by serving as the project director of the Tacoma Community College OER project. Uh, she has also been a librarian with the Washington State Open Course Library. Uh, Quill? Hi. Um, okay, so I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Una, is everything working with that? It sounds great, Quill. Perfect. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the TCC OER project. Um, the first thing that I think is um, really important when we talk about the project and, and the way that, I, that we approach it is that it's all about increasing the student learning. Um, it's, it invests in our students and teacher, um, teachers, so the idea is to combine both development of courses with student feedback, um, and it's a totally invitation process. So no one is forced to adopt an open education resource, and students have so many choices between the courses that they take that no one's forced into a class that has open education in it. So um, the idea is completely voluntary, but saving students money and increasing their access to education. So um, this slide shows our latest campaign. Um, we are working to save our students $250,000 on textbooks, and we said it was going to take us two years. Um, but what we're finding is that in the first two quarters that we kept track of how much um, money we were saving students, we've already saved them $128,000. So um, we're over halfway there. Um, and if you can see our progress so far, we started in fall quarter with six courses, 16 sections of six courses. Um, and next quarter we're planning on 18 separate courses and 39 sections. So um, it, the adoption has moved a lot faster than, than I originally had planned when we started this project back in April. Um, and that's really exciting and encouraging because I figured, you know, when we started this project, I said we can do 10 full conversions in two years. And we've almost doubled that number in half the time. So it's a very exciting number for me because it means that it's working um, and that we're having steady increase. So how are we making that happen? That's always what I want to know when I attend these, these um, sessions. I want somebody to tell me how to make it happen at my college. And here's the problem. I can't tell you how to make it happen at your college. I can tell you how it works at TCC, and I am going to do that. Um, but 
I have discovered that every interaction with every faculty member, every interaction with every department, and every interaction at every institution is different. So what I can give you is what works with the faculty members that I work with here at Tacoma Community College. It's a different experience when you're working with people at different institutions. So take what I'm talking about, um, take the message, use that, but don't try to craft the same thing that we've got going here because I don't know that it would work anywhere else. Um, so this is the part where I want to know more about you. So can you give me a green check mark? It's on the top um, left for the yes. If you have an OER project at your institution right now, or if you're building one right now. So it looks like we have quite a few people who have projects going, at least six. Um, and in the meantime, can you also enter for me in the chat window um, what you hope, what you want to learn from me during this presentation? And I'll try to address them as I go. We're still collecting check marks, but I see at least seven projects, seven people who are aware of projects that are happening at institutions. That's a lot. It's really, I've asked this question in other groups and I get zero. Answer. So it's good to see so many people are focusing on OER. Um, is that a comment? Okay. Um, oh, that's a great question. Benjamin's asking, how do we get faculty buy-in? So um, I'm going to go back to your questions as we move forward. Let me talk a little bit about the TCC OER project, and hopefully I'll answer some of your questions as we go, and I'll go back to them. So. Um, most particularly, we're going to talk about the roots of the TCC OER project. Um, I'm going to tell you what's working, what I think about changing sometimes, and my dreams for the future. So um, let's start with the roots of this project. Um, the TCC OER project is really unique in that it's not grant funded. It's funded by the institution and by the students. So our students at TCC have some control over how their um, tech fees are are distributed, um, and they so our um, administration before I was here put together a request to put to do an OER project, and took it to the students and told them what we wanted to do, um, and the students came back and said, please spend our money this way. Be, this is what we want. We want you to save us money. So um, we had the buy-in of the students. That was fairly easy, although they did have to commit funds. Um, and we had the buy-in of the institution already so um, because they funded this project. So um, that's a pretty important step to have that work already in place. Um, the other part is we had a big amount of um, buy-in from the faculty already because they see the textbook costs and how it impacts our students. And um, they're set up with the same things, you know, the arguments that, that you've probably all heard, things like, my students don't have the textbooks on the first day of class, or some of my students never afford the textbook, or I, I can't teach this entire textbook. So Washington State, most of the community colleges, in fact, I think all of them have um, a 10-week quarter rather than a full semester. So um, their semester books that are built for semesters are too big for our classes. Um, so those are some issues that a lot of our faculty members have faced over time. And so they were pretty bought into the process already, although not every faculty member buys the process. Um, so those are the roots of our project. Let me tell you what's working. Um, so the things that work best right now, um, I can tell you that it's an invitation process. If the faculty members are invited to participate, they're much more likely to want to participate. So um, no one's forced to adopt OER. Um, no one, and, and everybody who has adopted OER ha is, is allowed, it goes, adopts the type of OER that they're looking for. So we have some faculty who adopt 
full textbooks from places like OpenStax College. Um, we have faculty members who adopt modular processes, so they do a modular teaching, um, and they're adopting small pieces of different OER. Um, and, and then we do things like smaller adoption to start. So some faculty members don't lose their textbook the first time. We just do a few of the parts of their lessons to OER until they're comfortable with the entire process. Um, another thing that's working is that um, at TCC we're currently transitioning from an old learning man from one learning management system to another one. Um, and as we go through that transition, people are looking at their um, curriculum anyway. They're they're starting to evaluate what they've been teaching and how they've been teaching it. And it's a natural time to wonder if we can change to OER. Um, because you have to move all those modules over anyway, you might as well look at them and see what's working and figure out if you can use another system. So it's an opportunity, this is a great opportunity to increase the use of OER. Um, we do a survey as, as students use um, take OER classes, we survey them, and we found that 88.5% of the students who responded to the fall survey um, would like to use OER again, and 82% of them had easy access to their materials. So one of the things on the what's not working <laughs> or things we think about changing um, is there's always a concern that the digital divide is going to keep students from having access to materials that are largely digital. Um, and what our students are telling us is that's not a concern they have. The bigger concern is the cost, the initial cost of a textbook. So rather than drag a textbook around, they'd like to, they, they're telling us in the survey that they feel more comfortable trying to find web access. Um, so that's encouraging. <laughs> um, other things that we think about changing um, and things that I, I would urge everybody to consider. Um, when we started the OER project, I committed I was going to have a great relationship with our bookstore. And in the midst of the work, the relationship with our bookstore didn't break down, but it kind of got sidelined. Um, and that makes it hard for the bookstore to be able to communicate to the students what they're expecting um, when they go in to buy their books if they don't know. Um, so I, I'm rebuilding that relationship now, um, and it's one that I wish that I'd spent more time keeping alive and well. Um, and something else that is just, we're working on it again, is um, the students don't, we, there's no way for the students to know right now when they sign up for their classes, other than check an outside list, if they're just signing up for a class that's OER. So, um, they don't know that they're going to save money. And so for a lot of students, it's a really happy surprise when they go to buy their textbooks. But I would like for them to be able to be more strategic about the classes that they're selecting. Because in my dream world, so we're moving on to my dreams for the future, um, one of the dreams that I have for the future of the OER project at TCC is that every student can save money. Every student has an opportunity to save money on their textbooks. And they know that they're saving that money. Um, so I would like for every student to be able to to be strategic about the quarter that they save that money. Um, because I think students are very strategic with their use of money um, and with the classes that they take at the time that they take them. And I want to give them the gift of knowing that they can take an English 101 class and they will not have to pay $70 for that textbook in the quarter that they take the English 101 class. Um, so we're working on that. Um, I also want to empower students, another dream of mine, is that every student at every opportunity has the ability to say to their instructor, why are we using this learning resource? What's the best thing about this reading resource? So even if they're paying for a resource, they understand why they're paying for it. Because I'm not in the business of running every textbook publisher out of business. What I do want our students to be able to do is, and I want our faculty to have to explain what makes a resource a great resource, um, why it's a part of their class rather than it's a textbook, we've always had a textbook. That's not a good answer. Um, so um, those are my big dreams for the project. And I'm going to go back and look at your questions really fast. So Eric, I'm going to start with yours. Why don't you advertise in advance to students which courses are using OER? Um, we do, or we have started to. So in the beginning, we didn't because it was, you know, I wasn't sure how to do it. Um, but it's not published in the course schedule right now because um, 
I want to reach a higher critical mass of faculty members who have fully adopted OER and feel confident about them before I get it put into our regular schedule. Um, so that's really why we're not doing it. Um, let's see. Do I have any obstacles? I'm Preston, I'm not sure if I understand your question about contracts with vendors. Um, there are, in some cases, there are textbook vendors that have given us, um, that we have a contract with that says we can't purchase any other textbook, but since the students aren't purchasing anything, it's not really a, a barrier because our answer to that is, well, they didn't buy anything at all. Um, and we haven't had any challenges on that yet. And I'm knocking on wood right now that we don't have that happen <laughs> um, because it would be a horrible thing to have a contract that the institution made hurt the students um, in any way. Um, communities of practice, Rick, you asked about communities of practice among the faculty, and that was the original plan was to develop communities of practice. We are, um, some of our professional development at TCC depends on learning communities, and a lot of the OER adoption has actually come from learning communities, so they were kind of already primed and ready to go when I got here, which was wonderful. Um, but yes, we do some communities of practice. Mostly what we do is um, try to get one person within a, a department, a, a really involved faculty member who is um, interested in OER to start that conversation rather than having that conversation come from the OER director, which would be me. Um, you know, I'm more than happy to start those conversations, but it's better when it comes from a faculty member who's interested and who has ideas already. So my position, my work is much more in support of the faculty members who want to make this happen for themselves rather than um, recruiting people who might be reluctant to start with. Um, so Una, how am I doing on time? Uh, you're doing fine, Phil, um, and um, we do have some other questions and some may be um, uh, for you or um, for others. Are, are you, you go ahead and complete uh, your um, session, Quill, if you aren't done yet. Well, I've covered the OER project at TCC, um, so I am... Um, Oh, Eric is asking um, what percentage of our funds are coming from student funds. Um, it's a little under 50%, so it's like 40% of the project is funded by student money. That's very exciting. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's, on, it, it's all student fees. So it's money that they would have been paying anyway. It was just earmarked for OER instead of being earmarked for any of the other projects that they could fund. It is a great idea. It's wonderful because you have the buy-in. So students are on my advisory committee. They get to, to direct some of the way that their money is being used. And the great news is the $128,000 more than makes up what they put into the project. So I can tell them in year one, you got your money back. Um, Oh, someone was asking about the process for vetting OER. Um, that's done individually with the faculty members. So one of the things that we do is we're lucky enough to be in a state where we did the open course library. So we have a lot of resources to draw. And you guys all have the same resources, but we happen to have somebody here who worked on the project, um, which would be me. So we have a lot of resources to draw from already. Um, the faculty members are the ones who do the assessment. So I give them um, I often put together a packet of here's what's great resources in your area, but I'm not a content expert, so I ask faculty to um, tell me what works for them, what they want to see, and then we, um, we work it from there. So they do a lot of the vetting. All right. Thanks very, thanks very much, Quill. Um, would any of our other panelists like to talk about vetting OER resources as well? Um, hi, this is Preston. I was just going to say that uh, at NOVA it's the same thing. Um, our faculty as the content matter experts are the ones who um, do the vetting, but we have our um, librarian and, and others that are able to help um, find resources and then the faculty can ultimately make the decision as to whether they are um, going to meet the um, 
search student learning outcomes of the course. Okay. I, I would yeah, thank you, Preston and, and Quill, and also Donna who chimed in with that it works the same at Scottsdale. I would just add one additional comment to that, which is um, the different OER repositories, and off the top of my head, I'm just going to mention a couple of them, so um, I may miss your favorite one, but both Connections, Merlot, um, College Open Textbooks, um, they all have some form of peer review or rating system um, which allows um, faculty, and in some cases any interested person, to make comments and to leave their credentials. But there is an attempt at all of the major repositories to provide um, some kind of a rating system, and sometimes it's actually peer reviews. Um, which help faculty to maybe um, wade through some of the initial OER um, before they go in and actually read it and evaluate it themselves. And yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, I think librarians are, are huge in uh, this um, in this role as well, the curating of OER. Um, let's go back and see. Um, if we had other questions that were pending. Um, <clears throat> if you asked a question earlier um, <laughs> and it wasn't answered, um, would you please go ahead and repeat that um, just in case we've missed it? And Eric, yes, a recording of this session will be available for viewing later. Um, it probably will be um, sometime next week and it will be available on the Open Education website. It will also be um, posted at the community college Consortium um, OER website um, as well, and I'll put a link to that so um, you can find that um, next week. Um, we had another question from, from, from Domi. She asked, would it be desirable if we could filter OER by learning outcomes? Um, would one of our panelists like to take that? Uh, Domi, I'll give that a shot. I think that um, what I have found a lot with the learning objectives is it's, it's really by um, at least looking for them. It's, it seems easier now to look by content. Um, and however, I agree with you that I think that they might be more usable if they were um, categorized by, by learning objectives. So I think that's a really great idea. Um, I don't know how many of them actually are categorized that way, but I think it would be nice to move in that direction. And, and I think also, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think also that... Yeah, um, go ahead, Preston. If you look at the subject matter and then the courses are are shared or the at least the um, uh, like a course outline that shows what the learning outcomes are uh, for the course, then it can help others who are are looking for specific um, OERs to see which ones other institutions have found are meeting their learning outcomes. That's interesting. Um, I would also say learning outcomes aren't universal. So sometimes, um, and I'm picturing Merlot here, are the search features that are available at Merlot. That's by discipline, and I find that really useful. Thank, Thank you for that, Quill. Yes, and Merlot it, it does have a wonderful system where um, faculty can go in there and do rating. Uh, uh, and add additional information, uh, including peer reviews. So we're just coming up on the hour. We have a couple more minutes, so we're here to answer additional questions. I just entered um, the evaluation survey in our um, chat window, and we'd love to get feedback on Open Education Week, how you've been enjoying this webinar, or any other ones that you've attended this week, or any other resources that are available up on the openeducationweek.org site. I want to thank our presenters for sharing their um, amazing projects. Um, 
that they are uh, working on, and uh, and as they evolve, we hope to um, to get them back on here to tell us more. Um, so uh, please, uh, we have a few more minutes if you have questions, and uh, we do have our contact information here on the screen for those of you who would like to contact us after the fact. So thanks everyone for coming, and thank you to our presenters. All right, at this point I will turn off the recording and uh, we will talk to you all later I hope.